Thanks, President Jason. Today's speaker is Jennifer Uphoff Gray. She is the founding artistic director of Forward Theatre Company, which is now celebrating its 10th anniversary season. Jennifer will share with us the company's evolution over the past 10 years, with particular attention to the mission-driven growth in areas of community impact, support for local artists, audience engagement, and arts advocacy. So please help me in joining and welcoming Jennifer Uphoff Gray to the podium. Hello, everybody. I'm very excited to be here. It's really um, a wonderful thing. How's that? Sound good in the back? Okay. It's, it's really meaningful for me to be in this wonderful room where I can look around and see so many friends, so many colleagues, so many neighbors, and to know that you're all brought together every week because of your shared commitment to making our community and our world a better place for everyone to live. It's really, um, you all inspire me deeply, and it's, so it's, tr it's truly an honor to have been invited here to talk with you today. Um, although I also have to say that I, I look around this room, I see so many people that I'm used to um, saying hello to and, and, and shaking your hands and hugging you in, in our lobby. How many of you have come to see forward theater shows in the past? <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. Um, so this season marks Forward's 10th anniversary. Um, I was invited to talk to you a little bit about our evolution over this first decade, and particularly to focus on the ways in which our mission has influenced the growth and the decisions that we've made over these first 10 years. So our mission statement, oh, it works, excellent. Our mission statement's pretty succinct. Creating a home base for Wisconsin's theater professionals and audiences that expands the cultural and economic life of the greater Madison area. We've worked incredibly hard to be true to those really straightforward values all throughout our choices. And as we've grown, we've been looking for ways that we can deepen and expand our commitments to those values. And so today I thought I would talk really briefly about those choices in four different areas, as Stacey said, in our support for local artists, in our arts advocacy, in our audience engagement, and then in our community impact. So first, support for local artists. Many of you know already that a really key part of Forward's mission is providing paid employment for Wisconsin's theater professionals to ensure that they can continue to stay and live and work here in our area. When we founded Forward in 2009, in the midst of the Great Recession, three professional union-based theater companies in southern Wisconsin had recently closed their doors. So we were really concerned that there was going to be this prospect of local theater artists leaving our state in order to find work or leaving the field altogether. So here at Forward, we hire roughly 100 artists and technicians every season. That number's actually gone up now that we've expanded our programming. So over our first decade, that's over 1,000 co paid contracts that we've offered to keep people employed in our region. And over 95% of those contracts went to people who reside here in southern Wisconsin. And this focus on local artists benefits us at Forward in a lot of different ways. I mean, on the very fundamental level, we save money on housing and transportation by using people who live locally. We attract more ticket buyers by using actors who are already well known and loved by area theater goers. And this can give us room sometimes to try more adventurous programming because a risky play isn't necessarily going to seem quite so scary when you know that Sarah Day is starring in it. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that these artists live where they work has manifold benefits for our local economy, many of which contribute to our long-term financial health. And this focus on local hiring has been part of our mission and our work from season one. But over the past decade, we've been purposefully expanding that commitment to being a home base for artists in a variety of new ways. So several years ago, we embarked on a board-driven artist investment initiative to increase the wages that we pay to all of our artists. Our early seasons had been really focused on kind of playing catch up to our peer organizations in this area. We wanted to, you know, we were building from, from, from zero and wanted to, to catch up to, to pay rates um, at, at organizations similar to ours. And then we said, you know what, we can do better. And it was really moving to all of us artists in the company that this was a board driven uh, initiative. So first we set a goal of making sure that everybody working for us was making a minimum of $10 an hour. 
And so then we, we, we went past that goal and we said, okay, what is an actual living wage here in Madison, Wisconsin? Currently, according to MIT, it's $11.52 per hour. Everybody who works for us makes more than that amount. So now we've set an internal goal of by 2020 being able to lead the way amongst all of our peer-sized organizations in the region in our pay rates. And it's been wonderful to see the influence that the work we've done in this area has had on some of our peer companies already. So from the beginning, we were set on creating a home base for actors, directors, designers, technicians. And so over this first decade, we've also thought we could do more to provide a home base for Wisconsin playwrights. So one of the things we've done recently is expand our Wisconsin Rights New Play Festival to provide professional support to developing new works by Wisconsin-based authors. And in a major milestone for Forward, a few years ago, we commissioned our first play. Learning to Stay was adapted by a local playwright, James DeVita, from a book by a local author, Aaron Solello. It had its world premiere on our stage in the spring of 2017, and it also garnered us our first NEA grant, and that's something we're incredibly proud of. As I've uh, said many times in the past while we were working on Learning to Stay, commissioning a world premiere play was a very grown-up theater company thing to do. Um, it's something we very much hope to do more of in the future, and um, I can tell you we're dreaming some pretty big dreams right now about some, some new work initiatives, especially some statewide projects that we're cooking up, so um, stay tuned for more on that. So another way that we've tried to grow in our support for local artists over this first decade is by expanding the circles of artists that we work with here at Forward and that we invest in beyond the theater. On one of our projects, we partnered with local poets to create a poetry challenge around the themes of one of our shows. And on several occasions, we've worked with visual artists to create art exhibits, um, public free exhibitions of their work that tie into some of our productions. The most recent example of that uh, is currently up at the Wisconsin Historical Society. Um, it's called Faces of Oscar Mayer. Our September show, Skeleton Crew, was about factory workers in Detroit. And so we went out and we hired a local photographer and asked him to take portraits of people who'd given their lives working to Oscar Mayer, working with Oscar Mayer, um, to, to connect the issues of, of factory work and what it means for a community to stories right here in our own community. Um, that exhibit's gonna be up for a while longer, so if you haven't had a chance to go to the Wisconsin Historical Museum recently, I encourage you to check it out. You can see these are really stunning portraits. So what's really, though, at the root of our focus on local artists? So we were started, as I said, during the Great Recession, and we couldn't help but be inspired by the role of the arts in America during the Great Depression in the 30s, when from the top of the federal government on down, there was a clear recognition that artists could play a crucial role in helping our country through times of crisis. By documenting our current situation, by inspiring and entertaining artists, audiences, by generating revenues for local communities, and by using the creativity that's required by our profession to come up with solutions to our common problems. So it's no wonder that advocating for the central and essential role of the arts and artists in our country became a big part of Forward's focus. So we've been really trying to use our community platform to advocate more broadly for the importance of arts and artists in our city, in our state, in our region, and in our country. Our platform as one of Overture Center's resident companies gives us extra opportunities to do that, and I just want to say a quick hello and thank you to all of my colleagues here from Overture Center and from the resident companies that, like us, call Overture home. It is a privilege and an honor to work with all of you, and, and I know all the good work that you do in this area as well. So one thing that, that I frequently try to highlight uh, when, when I'm speaking in occasions like this is the substantial economic impact that arts organizations have. And I'm especially keen to change the impression of the arts as a sector that is somehow underwritten by government dollars. In fact, the opposite is true. Arts organizations contribute vastly more to the economy than is returned their way in funding support. Um, so, okay, soapbox, here we go. Uh, this summer, new statistics were released by, uh, for the latest arts and economic prosperity study. So here in Wisconsin, local nonprofit arts groups generated 
$657 million in annual economic activity, resulting in nearly $75 million in local and state tax revenues, nearly 27,000 full-time equivalent jobs, and $555 million in resident income in one year. By contrast, Wisconsin's legislator, legislature appropriated just under $800,000 to support the arts in 2018. This is bad for our state in a lot of ways, and not the least of which is the lost economic opportunity. Off my soapbox. <laughs> So uh, at Forward, we see ourselves as another local business. We run this company with all of the thoughtful planning of any other successful business. Even with our rapid growth over this first decade, from our starting bank balance in the spring of 2009 of $56, <laughs> to our annual operating budget this season of $1.2 million, we have been in the black the entire time with not a penny of debt. Thank you. Um, it's something where we're incredibly proud of that. It's, we've worked very hard. Um, and it, what's important is that that fiscal stability has allowed us to be making strategic changes that expand what we do here in the community. For example, it's why we were able to go this year from three productions a season to four. This allows us to have uh, more artists hired, more local investment in the local economy, and more patrons welcomed to the theater. And when we welcome those patrons to the theater, a central focus of our mission is not just presenting shows, but creating a home base for those audiences. We started off small in that area, but we've grown exponentially there as well over this 10 year period. So at our very first production in season one, we chose to do two things that we thought could help introduce ourselves to the community as a new company. First, we asked members of our staff and our board of directors and our advisory company of artists to sign up to attend productions, uh, performances in the Overture Lobby, so that they could be there to greet our audience as they arrived and say, welcome, welcome to your theater. And then the second thing we decided to do was to have talkbacks after every performance, not just one or two during the run, as is typical, but after every show. We thought that those two steps, the greeting in the lobby and having the talkbacks, will give people a chance to talk to us and share their thoughts and their questions. Theater can sometimes feel like a very one-sided conversation. We present a story to you, you sit there to hear it, and then you go home. And we really wanted dialogue, a back and forth relationship with our audience. It's so that we could ensure that we were actually providing a service to the community. And there's only one way to know that, and that's to listen to the audience. What we didn't know when we started doing those talkbacks was how impactful and popular they would become. That first year, we would find that maybe 30 or so patrons would stay behind each night to talk with us, and that seemed really promising, and we thought, you know, let's keep this going in season two. We'll, we'll continue to do talkbacks after every show, and you know, when people stop coming, we'll stop doing them. Uh, so now in season 10, uh, we, I don't know that we've ever had a performance where fewer than 100 people stay. It's often closer to 200, sometimes it's over 200. And out of a house that only sits 300 people, it's a pretty big percentage of our audience. So um, people will frequently tell us that this is their favorite part of the Forward Theater experience. It is certainly mine. I gain more from those interactions than from anything else that we do. So another thing we did for our audience engagement, in our second season we experimented with having uh, pre-show talks that people could come to an hour before curtain, learn a little bit more about the show they were going to see, get some more context. For, some people like to come in and know nothing about the play, but for those who like to know more, we would started doing this. And demand from them soon became, as you can see, very high. So we, uh, since then, have been doing them every single Thursday, every single Sunday, an hour before curtain. And what those pre-show lectures and talkbacks quickly taught us was how eager Madison audiences are to know more about the plays that they're going to see. And so we started programming one-time events around particular productions. And one example, in season five, we produced a play called Red, and I am sure quite a few of you saw that, and it was about the artist Mark Rothko. So we reached out to the Chazen Museum of Art, and we partnered with them to fly in a national expert on Rothko's work to do a free public lecture. And it was incredibly fun. So many people showed up that 10 minutes before the lecture was scheduled to begin, we had 
packed their smaller auditorium. There were lines of people outside, and so they said, all right, we're moving, and everybody got up, and we marched over to their other building, to their other auditorium, in a little parade. And even that venue wound up being standing room only. On several occasions, we've brought the author of one of our plays to Madison for free public events. We've flown in Lauren Gunderson. She was the author of both Silent Sky and I and You that we produced it forward. She's now one of the top most produced playwrights in the country. And we've brought her to Madison twice, both to do uh, free public lectures at the library or at the science festival, but also to meet with students at the UW Madison campus in the theater department and to run classes for them. And this spring, coming up, we're going to be bringing in Aaron Posner, who's the author of our upcoming and exquisitely titled production, Life Sucks. <laughs> so, so events like this serve our existing audience. Over the past decade, we've also invested more in bringing our performances to audiences outside of Overture Center. We first partnered with the Dane County Libraries in our fourth season to bring free theater to library patrons. This relationship kept expanding and expanding, and now we do over a dozen free events in libraries across the county every season. And last year, we started doing free public readings of plays that might not fit in our normal seasons, but that are just a tremendous amount of fun. Um, over the last year, we've done public readings of plays like Harvey and The Mouse Trap and An Inspector Calls. We've been offering these every few months at locations all around town. Um, for anyone who's interested, the next one is coming up this Saturday at the Chazen Museum at 2 p.m. We're doing a, a comic mystery called The Games Afoot. Uh, I may have been talked into being in it myself. Uh, feel free to join us. These are the only opportunities you will ever have to see me act. Uh, so we'd love to have you join us if you're free on Saturday afternoon. And as I mentioned earlier, there are many benefits to working with artists who are part of this community. And a key one is that we're all very personally invested in making this community as strong as it can possibly be. So very early on, we realized that expanding the cultural and economic life of the greater Madison area didn't need or want to be limited to just doing good shows and hiring local artists, although we do those two things and we're very proud of them. We learned from our audiences that when we program shows dealing with relevant local issues, they were looking to us for more. More information on those issues, more connections with local groups doing good works, more opportunities to learn and to get involved themselves. And now if you know anything at all about me and my upbringing in a very active political family, you know that I took this opportunity and ran with it. Um, and the amount of time and energy and funds that we invest at Forward in partnerships has grown significantly over this past decade. So now when we choose a show for our season, we immediately look at the storyline and discuss whether there are local organizations working on similar issues that we might shine a spotlight on. These are just a few of the organizations we've partnered with in our first decade. Sometimes we provide information in our lobby and in our playbills about these organizations' good work, share it on social media and on our website. Sometimes we hold fundraisers to raise money for these organizations and the work that they do. Sometimes we collaborate on outreach programming, such as panel discussions with community leaders. We've done those on issues like bullying in the schools, school violence, um, on the new partnership schools that are part of the MMSD. And sometimes we provide free private performances for groups of people with deep personal connections to our stories. And I have to say these particular events have provided some of the most impactful experiences of my life as an adult. We worked with the VA and the Wisconsin Veterans Museum to offer a safe space performance of learning to stay for area veterans and their families to experience this story about PTSD in a safe and supported environment. One attendee who is a psychiatrist in the VA's PTSD clinic told us afterwards, this is exactly what I see in my work. Exactly, you nailed it. We gave a private performance last winter of exit strategy for members of the Madison Metropolitan School District's faculty and staff. Gave them a chance to talk about parallels between our story about a struggling school and these teachers' experiences right here in Madison. And afterwards, Jen Cheatham emailed us and she said, this was an extraordinary opportunity for us to laugh, 
reflect and dialogue about the importance of our profession as well as the need for investing in schools and neighborhoods. And then just last month, we had a free performance of Fun Home, which is the first Broadway musical that's ever featured a lesbian protagonist. And in partnership with GSAFE, we hosted over 300 teens from middle and high schools across Dane County for, who are members of their school's Gay Straight Alliance Clubs to come and see this performance for free and have an extended talk back with the cast. Look at those faces, come on. <laughs> so here's what one of those teens wrote to us um, after they saw it. She said, I was very grateful to see this show. It felt different than seeing it on my own. Being able to interact with students with something in common was really good. I got to connect with old friends and make new ones. Being able to see an LGBT character was amazing. The show provided a way for students to connect with emotions not always brought up in media. And the show was the highlight of my day. So beyond show specific projects like those, we've also built longer term relationships with several local groups. One of our early partnerships was with the Goodman Community Center. We were inspired by a common donor to both of our organizations, and we started looking for ways to partner and expand our impact. So this is now our sixth season of not only providing free tickets to groups of seniors and teens from GCC's programs, but also sending artists from forward to meet with those groups both before and after they see our shows. So they learn from us about what they're going to see, and then we learn from them about their experiences at our theater. All of these partnerships have inspired all of us at Forward, and they make us feel incredibly proud to do the work that we do in this particular community. We couldn't run a company like this just anywhere and have it be as successful as Forward has been. We are so incredibly lucky. And as we prepared internally for our 10th anniversary season, we all kept coming back to the idea that this milestone really was best going to be celebrated by expressions of gratitude. So we decided to mark each of the 10 months of this anniversary season by paying it forward. We like to pun on forward wherever possible and giving back to just 10 of the many nonprofit organizations that we've been privileged to partner with in our first decade. So far, we've announced four of those 10 partnerships, uh, Madison's Community Theater Artists, and we've represented those working with Bartell and Broom Street Theater, uh, with Fair Wisconsin, with the Goodman Community Center, and with the Alzheimer's and Dementia Alliance of Wisconsin. Stay tuned in January for the announcement of number five. And so now we're well positioned to dream even bigger than before, especially on the heels of our most recent show, Fun Home. That was by far our most high profile production. We had nearly 3,000 additional first time ticket buyers because of the extended week that we uh, added to our run. And with our own advisory company member, Karen Olivo in the show, it gen generated significant national attention. And so we are still thinking about how best we can leverage those new opportunities. And so we ask what's next for Forward Theater and I hope it's the same, but more. <laughs> more local artists hired and at higher wages. More development of new works. More arts advocacy at the local, state, and national level. More opportunities for our audiences to engage with the work that we do on stage. And more of our resources being committed to deepening our connections with more individuals and organizations in our community to continue expanding the representation in our work and in our audience. So I sincerely hope that you'll all consider joining us for our second decade here in Madison as we further expand our mission-driven work. And as I'm very fond of saying whenever I'm called upon to make a toast, onward, upward, and forward. And in true forward fashion, now we get to have a talk back. So thank you for your time and I look forward to your questions. Now, Ron. Thank you for being here. I was wondering if you could talk in a little bit more detail about the synergies that occur between uh, Forward Theater, American Players Theater, mm -hmm. Milwaukee Repertory Theater. Sure. And when you think about those three theaters and perhaps maybe another company in Milwaukee, what does that mean for us in the South Central, Southeastern Wisconsin compared to perhaps other parts of the country about the richness of our theater opportunities? Fantastic question. So really when we started Forward uh, at Celia Clare's kitchen table, um, a large uh, motivation for us was the fact that, you know, Madison is a small city. Um, it, it has never been a city that that sustained 
uh, a large group of professional theater artists who could work exclusively here in Madison, right? People were putting together um, careers where they would work in Madison, they would work in Spring Green, they would work in Milwaukee, maybe Rockford, maybe Beloit, but you could have a career going from show to show and live here in the region. And Madison was always this um, lovely link in the chain that helped tie all of those regions together. And so when Madison Rep closed in 2009, there was a sense that the middle kind of was falling out. And so we've always really seen our function in the state's professional um, theater landscape as bringing together artists who work at all those companies. You know, APT has a core company of artists and they work there from May through, you know, October or so every year, but they still need work the other half of the year. And many of not just their actors, but their technicians will come and work with us on our shows. Uh, we work with a lot of folks at Milwaukee Rep um, who will come and do a show with us in between their gigs there. Milwaukee Chamber, Renaissance Theater, um, Skylight, First Stage, Peninsula Players. I mean, we really, we see ourselves as a company that brings artists together from all of those different areas to work together here. And what's been great about that is it's really helped build connections between those companies and between the staffs. And, and I'm hopeful that it's building opportunities for, for our companies to work together uh, more broadly statewide. That's some of the, the ideas that we're cooking on for the future. But we take that, um, our, our part of being part of that ecosystem really, really seriously. And I'm glad you're seeing it um, as an audience member. Thanks, Jennifer, for being here. And thank you. Uh, there were a number of Rotarians who brought scholars to see your most recent production. It was so great to have them so, there, yeah. Um, question that I have, uh, architectural question, actually, sure. is the size of your of your venue. Yes. It uh, offers opportunities for very intimate experiences and yet must limit the productions that you consider. How do you consider the size of your venue and, and how that plays into, no pun intended, <laughs> uh, the shows that you uh, yeah. feature? That, that fabulous question. I love every talk back in every venue in Madison because you guys are so so smart. Um, it's absolutely a factor. When we read plays, one of the things that we're thinking about is, does this fit well in the playhouse? Um, we are incredibly happy to have the playhouse as our home. As you say, the intimacy of it is vital to the kinds of stories that we tell and the impact that those stories then have for the audience. Um, and every now and then we'll read a play and go, that, that, that doesn't work here. Um, but there are so many plays to choose from. There have only been a couple of occasions where there was a play where that I read and thought, boy, if we were in a different space, maybe we would do that. Um, so far, we haven't found it, it very limiting. But we, we do gravitate towards plays where we feel like we can um, really capitalize on that intimacy versus having it be be a barrier for us. And it was so great to have the Rotary Scholars in the audience. That was wonderful. Other questions? Any other questions? I wonder, Jennifer, how how young do you think you can go with this? I know you don't want to compete with Children's Theater of Madison. Agreed. But, you know, this club makes a has a big investment in one city early learning centers with preschoolers. Are, are you having a programming that you're focusing on younger kids and, and how does that work in relationship to the children's theater? Well, that's fantastic. Fantastic question. Um, because Madison is so well served by not just Children's Theater of Madison, but there are, there are quite a few really wonderful um, children's theater groups that serve um, young performers, young audiences that get into the schools. We've really purposefully not expanded in that direction because we're not interested in, in competing for services. We're interested in finding gaps and filling them in. One thing that we've really tried to focus on over the last few years, and I'm hoping to do a great deal more of in coming seasons, is teenagers. Because there, I do think that there's a, a, a not very robust uh, amount of opportunity available for teenagers interested in theater. I know, you know CTM does some small classes. There are a few groups that have very... Um, small programs, but but for, for broader, larger groups of teens, either who are interested in working on stage or behind the scenes, or just in seeing plays that speak to their experiences, there's not a lot going on in Madison. So that's really been a focal point for us, is figuring out 
how can we do more in that area? Um, so we've been doing um, school shows for high school groups when we have a play that seems especially well suited to teens um, and, and working with a lot of other organizations, the New House Theater here in Madison, um, trying to lend our support um, to groups that are working with teenagers. So, but you're right. I mean, having arts education and opportunity and access starting from preschool on up is so vital to our community, but we're, we're, we're really focused on where is there not enough happening in that area. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. A pleasure to be here. Thank you, Jennifer. We are adjourned. <laughs>